It's been more than half a year since I came to River Cottage, and my pigs are a week away from finishing, as their slaughter is euphemistically called. The logistics of their fate are causing me some anxiety. I had been hoping, in the best traditions of a smallholder, to be able to kill my pigs right here at River Cottage, with a minimum of stress and a minimum of fuss. Unfortunately, new European legislation, passed since I first brought them here, means that that civilised practice is no longer possible. If the pigs are killed anywhere other than an EC-approved abattoir, then they can only be eaten by me and my immediate family. But that's no good to me. Of course, I want some meat for my winter store, but I also need to pay back some debts to friends and neighbours, and pork is my prime currency. So the abattoir it must be. No, it's been one of the nicest things about the summer for me, having these pigs. Peggy Davil, who sold me the pigs in the spring, has offered to help transport them to a small abattoir just half an hour away. She reassures me I'm doing the right thing. The people who kill the pigs at the other end, they, they know exactly how to do it. They do it in the quickest possible way. And if you were doing it yourself, you'd only got to do one silly thing wrong. Mm. and uh, you'd be in trouble and the animal would be stressed up and no, it wouldn't be right. Right. There's no choice, they've got to go to the they abattoir. They have got to go to an abattoir. Of course, the other tricky thing I've got to decide is um, whether to go with them. I am a coward. I personally do not take my pigs to the abattoir. You and you alone have got to decide that. On their last day, I'm up early. The pigs will have to cross the footbridge over the river before we can load them onto Peggy's trailer. The last thing I want is for them to get stressed, so I'm lining the sides of the bridge to obstruct their view of the water and covering it with straw to prevent them from slipping. The odd jobbing is a welcome distraction from the real issue of the day. My pigs, who've been a daily part of my life since I arrived here, are finally on their way. Back left a bit. Luckily, I've barely finished the job when Peggy and her partner Steve arrive with the trailer. So have we done all right with this um, path, do you think, Steve? I can't see any problems at all. We're ready to go. I think we're ready to get on with it. Can you hold that down, please? The, the pigs were on half rations this morning and they happily follow a few handfuls of pig nuts into the back of the trailer. Run him, turn his head. Go on, go on. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. Excellent. Just got one gate shut and then they won't turn around. Fantastic job, Steve. It was okay. so much easier than I thought it was going to be. That went very well. I'm very pleased. Fantastic. I've decided I will accompany the pigs to the abattoir. I was there at the beginning, and I feel I ought to be there at the end. A tinge of sadness goes hand in hand with a fair measure of pride. I'd like to think I've raised two of the happiest pigs who ever lived in Dorset. A pig carcass should hang for at least five days before butchering, so there's plenty of time to make plans for dealing with the meat. In the seasonal cycle of the small holder, processing your pigs is a major event, certainly not something you'd want to tackle alone. Help from friends and neighbours isn't just a cute tradition, it's essential. I've got a couple of porky contacts up my sleeve, and the first of these is a master at curing arguably the most valuable part of a pig, its back legs. In a corner of Dorset that is forever Palmer lives Victor Bourge, connoisseur of the home-cured prosciutto. Ah, oh, so good. Is this a Palmer-style ham, as far as you're concerned? Is yeah, that pretty I, much how well, they would do it? This is how I try to get it as close to Palmer ham as possible. Because, mm. you know, I was when I, when I had running restaurants in London, Palmer ham and melon is always on the, mm. as a starter, you see. Mm. And I mm. think I will have a slice myself. Okay. Mm. I think I'll have my another eye, one if my I may. eye on this one. Victor cures a new ham every three months. He starts by rubbing a handful of salt inside the cavity of the boned-out leg. 
Then he uses a special butcher's needle to sew it up as tightly as possible. Okay. You couldn't do that with an ordinary needle and thread, could well, you? You know what I used to do is, is get a blow lamp and heat. A blow lamp? Yeah, heat the tip. Heat the tip of the iron? Yeah, and oh, it goes, really? whoosh, goes through. You're, you're cooking it at the same time so you can eat. <laughs> is it a, a high risk? business trying to go for one of these dry cure hams do they ever go completely rotten on you well we must give it time um, this is going to stay there for about a month in the salt in the salt really what the salt does it it stops bacteria mm -hmm. living there you are you see that looks good yeah. that has great potential isn't it it's looking rather hammy already <laughs> get the melon ready <laughs> um, weight wise I would say what would you say? Ten pounds, something. Uh, sort of More than it's at least ten, I'd say. We'll work on ten. Yeah. The that number of days the ham will be salted is two and a half times its weight yeah, in pounds. Not to waste salt. Yeah. Looks like Christmas, doesn't it? Uh, the legs should be completely covered by at least an inch of salt. A weight about twice that of the leg is placed on top to compress the meat and help draw out moisture. Well, that will stay there now for. Well, I'll uncover it slightly over 25 days and mm -hmm. see how it's going. And you can, well, I feel, you know, you say, well, it needs another five days, give it another five days. You've got to have a feel for these things. Oh, you have to feel. I mean, you know. And you obviously do. I do. I love feeling legs. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens after that? Well, there is, I'll show you. Um, when it feels right, the ham comes out of the box and is given a good wash to remove the excess salt. Then it's rubbed with wine vinegar and wrapped in muslin before being hung up for six months wind drying. It's a dangerous time for a ham. There's about 15 that live in this but day. But your no, ham's so good that the squirrels have they, become they, carnivorous. They come, they come because they know it's delicious and uh, I mean, might as well throw in a couple of melon. <laughs> <laughs> and a knife and fork. <laughs> a knife and fork. <laughs> but now I beat them. They come, look at it, and piss off somewhere else, because <laughs> they can't get in. <laughs> Victor's promised to come and oversee my own ham production. But first, there's work to be done on the raw materials. The carcasses of my pigs have been delivered to the cold store of semi-retired butcher Ray Smith. With Ray's help, I intend to make good use of every last scrap of meat. Are you happy with them? Yeah, they're very good. They've obviously been really well fed. they have got this really nice flair. That's just pure, top-grade fat. We don't, we don't want to waste that. We need to strip that out because that's really good for making top-quality lard. I don't want to or, waste anything. No, I've already no. started the cooking. I made some black pudding. Really? I waited at the abattoir for their blood. Mm. Took it away with me. It's good stuff. Yeah, right. When I'll you come over, I'll fry right. some I'll, up for you. I'm pretty good at tasting it. <laughs> yeah, good. Excellent. We've got 361 pounds of pig to deal with, and Ray starts by removing the tail. Next, he splits the carcass. The first half pig reveals the full potential of what is, to my mind, the noblest and tastiest animal reared and killed for food. First, the back legs are cut long for generous size hams. A bit darker than you'd normally see. Yeah, yeah it's got a really nice colour to that. Great. Then the pig is quartered by separating the loin from the belly. The rear half of the belly will become beautiful bacon. Oh, that is while the first seven ribs make my favourite roasting joint. Any off cuts will be used to make the finest sausages. And I've got something particularly exotic in mind for the trotters. All that now remains is the loin, which is divided into the spare rib roast, the chump end for gammon, and a yard-long rack of chops. In just an hour, we've turned half a pig into ten fabulous cuts of meat. I'm planning to throw a party once we've processed these pigs. Now I'm not sure I've invited enough people. But my head is certainly buzzing with the culinary possibilities. Next morning at River Cottage, it's an early start. I'm diving in head first, literally, with a classic brawn. To make this pressed, jellied, coarse pâté, the quartered heads go into a large pan with a faggot of herbs, a couple of onions and a bag of spices. The pan's set to simmer very slowly for at least five hours. The lid's securely weighted 
and I'm off to check out the bathroom where Ray and Victor are busy salting bacon and hams. Mm -hmm. Does your wife partake in this or do you do it on your own? That depends on the mood. <laughs> How are you getting on? Yeah. Oh, well, oh, you you well. Well. That's like a bizarre religious ceremony. Yeah. <laughs> You're not both Freemasons, are you? <laughs> no, I haven't seen his left leg yet. <laughs> I, 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 I've been reading about it. <laughs> I think we're just about ready to get these hams out now. And, uh, How about the bacon raisins? Well, I'm going to carry on with this. So I think okay, just a little bit more. I'm going to get in, push the one with the bone in here. I'm going to get that really worked in. Leaving Ray to finish off the bacon, Victor and I head outside to deal with the back legs. Two of them will be dry cured prosciutto getting the full Victor treatment. I don't have a lot of space around here, Victor, but we might just squeeze everything in the shed. Well, fit. Have a look, see what you think. The other two are salted for only two weeks. They'll end up boiled in cider, glazed with sugar and mustard, and baked as Dorset Christmas hams. The brawn is simmering nicely, but the ears are earmarked for special treatment, so they're removed after just three hours and left to cool. I think we're near can I very have a sniff near of yours, Hugh? Yeah. You think? Have a sniff. And you can have a sniff of mine. We combine forces on sausages. Oh. I'm doing a cider and apple version. Oh, quite cidery, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that'll yeah. come right out. Victor's making a oh, spicy oh. chili and garlic mix. That's, that's that is dynamite. Yeah. And is Ray is producing a good old-fashioned sagey say. butcher's banger. Ah. So that sage will be intense. Oh, it's very nice. Yeah, and yeah, I can nice. smell the nutmeg in that as well. Yeah, it's After the sniffathon, the mix goes into my new prize possession a 50s crank handled sausage stuffer. The meat is cased in pig's intestines as it emerges from the nozzle. And once Ray has stuffed, Victor shows me how to twist and shape. Now, which one, ha which one have you got? I've got this one and this one. <laughs> <laughs> this one's joined to that one. Where's the other end? Okay, here, here. Right, so well, let's start yeah, with this have one. Have you tied that one? No, uh, I still can't get a knot in it. Oh, do you want me to uh, hold on to this? No, I'm determined. It's all too easy to get your bangers in the wrong sort of twist. But somehow, eventually, we've got 15 pounds of sausages hung up on the porch, and it's time to break for an awfully fine lunch of pig's kidneys fried up with black pudding. I'm not going to fall out the victory over this. No, hang on. But if you keep eating that bloody black no, pudding... Haven't you had enough? <laughs> no. Mind your fork on my non-stick pan. Oh, oh all right. Yeah. It's, 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 we shouldn't start bickering because no, we've got, well, still got we've a lot of work to do. I no. thought... No. I, well, I think until this point we've not fallen out at all. So let... What Fix! Else, uh, what else is in this? Don't this steal his black pudding. What else is in this? Right. Right, good. If he does it again, stab his hand. There, there are three bits of kidney left. You're one each. Right, and it's right. back to work. Come on. Right. That's it. Let's go. Hooray! After lunch, we start picking over the boiled heads for the brawn. After almost six hours simmering, the meat and skin are as soft as butter. Get the old fat like that. There's a few little hairs There's here. A few, yeah, are well, we bothered about them? Can remove a few of them if you want. Experiment by tasting a hair. Actually, it's a very good way to get rid of the hairs with my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind if I don't join you on this occasion? <laughs> much, as I, much as I love food, I don't Yeah, a couple of handfuls of yeah. Once the bones have been picked clean and most of the hairs removed, a few handfuls of chopped parsley and the juice of a lemon are added. A large terrine dish is half filled and the specially reserved tongue is pressed into the middle. It's covered up with more of the mix and half a dozen spoonfuls of the gelatin-rich boiling liquid are added to help the pâté set as it cools under another weighted board. And that's quite enough cooking for one day. Thank you so much for your help. It's the day before the great pork feast and I'm hoping my guests will be suitably impressed by my latest bit of DIY. I put it quite high up to try and um get the smoke quite cool by the time it gets up here. I've knocked a hatch into the chimney about 15 feet above my fireplace to create my very own smoker. The fire's been stoked with oak and bay twigs and Victor's chilli and garlic sausages are the perfect subjects for our smoky experiment. They should be quite happy in there. Hmm. Victor, I think you should go up and have a little sniff. May I? Oh, look, wonderful. Oh, do I have to come down? Pass me a bit of bread. Bay, bay, I can smell the bay now. 
Leaving Victor to smoke himself silly, I join Ray to tackle the offliest dish of the day. We're stuffing a stomach with minced pork, chopped liver, spleen, kidneys and oatmeal, flavoured with sweated onions, sage, parsley, thyme, port and brandy. When Ray's finished his blanket stitch, it's put to simmer gently for three hours. Oh, now she's Finally, Victor and I squeeze out a few kilos of his favourite salamis. They'll hang in the shed to cure for three months. And that's it. Two pigs sorted. What I need now is a little time to de-pork, so I'm heading for the beach. But I can't quite take my eye off the party menu, and I've come to Studland Bay in East Dorset for a shoreline scavenge with Bill Gibbons. What a beautiful place. Yes, it is today, now the sun's out. Bill's been taking advantage of free seafood here since the 1940s, so I'm hoping to learn a wily trick or two. You've got much more salt in your bucket than I have in mine. Well, <laughs> Are we going to need a lot, do you think? Well, you can be a bit extravagant with it. Yeah? Yeah. OK, <laughs> good. With salt at the ready, we head for the low tide mark, home of the elusive razorfish. What are we actually looking for when we're looking for razorfish? Just a small dent in the sand with a little pool of water. A small eye, about the size of your fingernail. Oh, so it's quite a big hole you're looking for. Yeah, oval shape. Yeah. What about that? Is that one? Yeah, I should think that looks like one. The razorfish is actually a kind of clam, and Bill catches it in an ingenious way. Once he finds a burrow, a dose of cooking salt irritates the subterranean bivalve until, with a bit of luck... There it comes. Unbelievable. There we are. Look, mine's up as well. Yeah, he's got a gab it. Don't pull him too hard, though, because you'll pull the... Oh, he's got his foot stuck in. Yeah. He doesn't want to come out. God, it's a good size. Look at that. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, it's a good one. Whoa! That's amazing. Mm. Do they always come up? No, not always. They sometimes go down because their burrow goes down a metre. He's coming up though. Yeah, pull him gently. That foot is so strong. He'd... Yeah. It's like a tug of war. Come on. That's amazing. Up it goes again. Showing yourself off. It's quite obscene. <laughs> it's quite obscene, isn't it? Do you ever see, are there any birds that are specialised to get these guys out? Oh yeah, oyster catch as well. Really? The curlew. They've got long bills, haven't they? And they're designed especially for pulling things out the sand. A bit like you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, the incoming tide curtails the hunt. But we've a good half bucket full and call it a day. Look at the colour in the water now. The yeah, reflection, the reflection of that cloud. Yeah. Never seen anything like it. No, a real artist guy, isn't it? Sunday is party day, and I've got around 20 coming for lunch. It's going to be a bit of a culinary marathon. The pig's trotters are simmering, Chinese-style, with garlic, ginger and soy sauce. I've made a giant sausage, coiled and skewered for frying, and two of my favourite belly cuts are rubbed with salt and thyme for roasting. The ears are a treat not to be missed. Sliced, they're brushed with English mustard, rolled in breadcrumbs and drizzled with a little melted butter before crisping up in a very hot oven. Even the razor clams, which have been steamed open with a little garlic and white wine, are actually destined for yet another pork dish. This is a Portuguese dish, where you fry up your clams with loin of pork and a few slices of smoked sausage. Bizarre combination, but they happen to go incredibly well together. I feel I can truly say I've used everything but the oink. Mm. Yesterday's poached stomach is glazed with an intense reduced stock made from the roasted bones and goes into a hot oven for 20 minutes browning. There's also work to be done outside, spreading a bit of straw over my muddy terrace and lighting a welcoming bonfire for my guests. 
Then a quick change before my final preparations. The razor clams are stir-fried with the pork loin and spicy smoked sausages, a sprinkling of parsley, and then it's time to set the table. Hi, Serena. Well done. How are you doing? Good. So we've got to guess the bits of the anatomy, I'm told. That's not a bad game, actually. That's this is, a, a this is an easy bit, I think, isn't it? Oh, God, I'm hoping my crispy deviled ears will help break the ice. <laughs> Ray, get stuck oh, in. You know what that is, don't you? Oh, yeah, I do. Victor, oh, hi. So my dear Hugh, good morning. I know what this is. Oh, Steve, hi. Thank you. Peggy. You've got to guess what bit of the anatomy this is. That's oh, the first game. Hi, Joy. I think I'll just eat it. Oh, I reckon the ear and the snout's the best part of the pig. <laughs> Isn't it? My pork feast brings together the many people who've helped me make a go of life as a Dorset small holder. Look at that. Stomach. No, I don't want none of that, thank you. There's Barbara Gunning, Beminster Show Homecraft Queen, and my neighbours Anthony and Serena, whose ornamental pigeons were a vital source of pre-pig protein. Are you offering stomach? I'm on your right. I am offering stomach, absolutely. Couldn't possibly miss yours, actually. If I may be allowed to say so. Touche. Brown horny crab. We, we get these spider crabs at my great in. My diving skipper Dave introduced me to the joys of spider crabs. He's the cousin of Razorfish Bill. Reddish purple ones. Reddish purple ones. But you can eat all of them. Oh, yes, yeah. Oh. Well, I'll stay here till four o'clock. It's only quarter to three. Five <laughs> Everyone seems to be getting on famously, and I'm especially keen for Roy, the longest bean king, to meet Michael and Joy, my organic vegetable gurus. These gentlemen won, won the longest run of beans. In Those very brilliant chunks of gum. Is this, is this a case of mine's bigger than yours? I think there was enough food for everyone, and best of all, the rain held off. You know, I think I might. Perhaps we could move into bison and llamas. <laughs> Next morning at River Cottage, there's work to be done. Covering the mud in the pig pen with hay should help it to reseed in the spring. The party's over and the pigs have gone but somehow it doesn't quite feel like the end. After more than seven months as a Dorset downsizer, I think it's time to ask myself the big question. Should I stay down here or go back to town? It's not such a tough one. Should I stay in Dorset? Do chickens lay eggs? Is pork tasty? Do fish swim in the river? Are Dorset people friendly? Is the sound of the sea good for the mind? There's six points inside it. It's been more than half a year since I came to River Cottage and my pigs are a week away from finishing, as their slaughter is euphemistically called. The logistics of their fate are causing me some anxiety. I had been hoping, in the best traditions of a small holder, to be able to kill my pigs right here at River Cottage, with a minimum of stress and a minimum of fuss. Unfortunately, new European legislation, passed since I first brought them here, 
means that that civilized practice is no longer possible. If the pigs are killed anywhere other than an EC-approved abattoir, then they can only be eaten by me and my immediate family. But that's no good to me. Of course, I want some meat for my winter store, but I also need to pay back some debts to friends and neighbors, and pork is my prime currency. So the abattoir it must be. No, it's been one of the nicest things about the summer for me, having these pigs. Peggy Davil, who sold me the pigs in the spring, has offered to help transport them to a small abattoir just half an hour away. She reassures me I'm doing the right thing. The people who kill the pigs at the other end, they, they know exactly how to do it. They do it in the quickest possible way. And if you were doing it yourself, you'd only got to do one silly thing wrong. Mm. and uh, you'd be in trouble and the animal would be stressed up and no, it wouldn't be right. Right. There's no choice, they've got to go to the they abattoir. They have got to go to an abattoir. Of course, the other tricky thing I've got to decide is um, whether to go with them. I am a coward. I personally do not take my pigs to the abattoir. You and you alone have got to decide that. On their last day, I'm up early. The pigs will have to cross the footbridge over the river before we can load them onto Peggy's trailer. The last thing I want is for them to get stressed, so I'm lining the sides of the bridge to obstruct their view of the water and covering it with straw to prevent them from slipping. The odd jobbing is a welcome distraction from the real issue of the day. My pigs, who've been a daily part of my life since I arrived here, are finally on their way. Back left a bit. Luckily, I've barely finished the job when Peggy and her partner Steve arrive with the trailer. So have we done all right with this um, part, do you think, Steve? Can't see any problems at all. We're we ready to go. I think we're ready to get on with it. Can you hold that down, please? Out of the bucket, Q. The pigs were on half rations this morning and they happily follow a few handfuls of pig nuts into the back of the trailer. Don't let him turn his head. Go on, go on. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. Excellent. Just got the front gate shut and then they won't turn around. Fantastic job, Steve. It was okay. so much easier than I thought it was going to be. That went very well. I'm very pleased. Fantastic. I've decided I will accompany the pigs to the abattoir. I was there at the beginning, and I feel I ought to be there at the end. A tinge of sadness goes hand in hand with a fair measure of pride. I'd like to think I've raised two of the happiest pigs who ever lived in Dorset. A pig carcass should hang for at least five days before butchering, so there's plenty of time to make plans for dealing with the meat. In the seasonal cycle of the small holder, processing your pigs is a major event, certainly not something you'd want to tackle alone. Help from friends and neighbours isn't just a cute tradition, it's essential. I've got a couple of porky contacts up my sleeve, and the first of these is a master at curing arguably the most valuable part of a pig, its back legs. In a corner of Dorset that is forever Palmer lives Victor Bourges, connoisseur of the home-cured prosciutto. Ah, oh, so good. Is this a Palmer-style ham, as far as you're concerned? Is yeah, that pretty I, much how well, they would do it? This is how I try to get as close to Palmer ham as possible. Because, mm. you know, I was, when I, when I had running restaurants in London, Palmer ham, and melon is always on the, mm. as a starter, you see. Mm. And I mm. think I will have a slice myself. Okay. Mm. I think I'll have my another eye, one if my I may. eye on this one. Victor cures a new ham every three months. He starts by rubbing a handful of salt inside the cavity of the boned out leg. Then he uses a special butcher's needle to sew it up as tightly as possible. God, you couldn't do that with an ordinary needle and thread, could well, you? You know what I used to do is, is get a blow lamp and heat. A blow lamp? Yeah, heat the tip. Heat the tip of the iron? Yeah, and, and then it really? goes whoosh, goes through, you're, you're cooking it at the same time so you can eat. <laughs> is it a, a high-risk business trying to go for one of these dry cure hams? Do they ever go completely rotten on you? Well, you must give it time. Um, this is going to stay there for about a month. 
In the salt? In the salt. Really? What the salt does is it stops bacteria mm -hmm. living. There you are, you see, that looks good. Yeah. That has great potential, doesn't yeah. it? It's looking rather hammy already. <laughs> Get the melon ready. <laughs> um, Weight-wise, I would say, what would you say, 10 pounds, something? Uh, so More than, it's at least 10, I'd say. We'll work on 10. Yeah, the number of days the ham will be salted is two and a half times its weight in pounds. Not to waste salt, here. Really. Looks like Christmas, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. The legs should be completely covered by at least an inch of salt. A weight about twice that of the leg is placed on top to compress the meat and help draw out moisture. Well, that will stay there now for... Well, I'll uncover it slightly over 25 days and mm -hmm. see how it's going. And you can by really feel, you know, you say, well, it needs another five days, you give it another five days. You've got to have a feel for these things. You have to feel. I mean, you know. And you obviously do. I do. I love feeling legs. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens after that? Well, there is, I'll show you. Um, when it feels right, the ham comes out of the box and is given a good wash to remove the excess salt. Then it's rubbed with wine vinegar and wrapped in muslin before being hung.